American Christianity not being marginalized, but maybe claiming that it is, but but has has not figured out what does it mean to model the way of Jesus when you're not in the marginal position. So they have to sometimes claim like a victim status. I'm honored to have um, Dr. Dennis Edwards, who's also a reverend with me today to speak about his new book, Might from the Margins, um, as well as a little bit about um, his area of expertise, uh, first and second Peter. So uh, thank you, Dr. Edwards for, for being on. Oh, it's my privilege to be with you. I'm really glad. Thank you. Yep. And uh, for those who don't know, can you uh, give us a brief snapshot and overview of, of who you are and, and what your work is about, some, some projects, undertakings, some passions of yours? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm a native New Yorker. I've been married uh, since 1982, so I'm getting old, and uh, four adult kids and some grandkids. Um, so I put my family stuff first. That's really important to me. Um, I have a degree in chemical engineering, but I didn't really work as an engineer much. I, I taught math and chemistry for years. Uh, eventually went to seminary, um, did an MDiv. I served as a pastor for many years, even as I uh, went on to get an MA and a PhD in biblical studies. So I taught adjunct while also serving churches in New York, in DC for about 18 years in DC and six years in Minneapolis. Currently, I am Associate Professor of New Testament at North Park Theological Seminary in Chicago. Awesome. Awesome. And we're going to be talking, like I said, about your new book, uh, Might from the Margins. And, and can you just uh, spell out a bit uh, why you set out to write this book at this time? What, what led you to write it? And what do you hope to convey to the modern American church? Sure. Thank you. There were probably, I would say, at least three things that I think of right away that that came together for me as I was as I wrote the book. One was I had done the work in First Peter, and you mentioned my uh, Petrine work, and uh, and just was intrigued by this notion of Christians on the margins as uh, Peter is writing to a community that's being alienated, harassed. Uh, some might even use the word persecuted uh, for their faith. Then also, I had been a pastor for many years and been in settings that were striving to be multicultural or multi-ethnic. We use different languages at different times, even multiracial at times, and, and kept running into difficulties along the way, which I was seeing again now as an older person, I was seeing those same struggles happening in churches. And I think the third thing was that a lot of books that I had seen written for uh, Christians to think about race or racism or how the Bible speaks to those issues were really written for white people to try to uh, change their way of thinking. And I had, I had gotten, I guess, a little frustrated with that. And I thought I'd like to write a book for, for other um, minority folks or marginalized folks or people who have been pushed to the margins to say, you know, we have a voice and we have power because of the Holy Spirit, because of the gospel. And we don't need to wait for white people to give us permission to raise our voices. So those things came together as I uh, wrote the book. Wow. Wow. And, and I was going to ask you about that, about uh, why write another book on this, but you kind of hinted at that mm -hmm. already. Um, and, and so far, what has uh, the reaction been? Hmm. To this? Well, I mean, there's some younger scholars getting a lot more reaction than I got from other <laughs> book from their books than I get from <laughs> mine. So, but I would say for the most part, overwhelmingly there's been positive response and often from white people too who feel like, uh, well, I don't know what they feel, but they're expressing a, uh, an appreciation for my voice uh, because I share a lot of experience from my pastoral background as well as I try to do some good exegesis along the way of some biblical passages. So uh, it's been generally uh, well received from people. That's awesome. And, mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask about, <clears throat> I guess, the American church. I know they're not monolithic. Uh, right. it's, it, the American church is obviously not monolithic. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, we're, we're at a sort of crossroads when it comes to how we talk about, you know, spiritual things in this box over here, which sometimes includes preaching or evangelism. And then there's yeah. this other category that we have for um social work or the updated language right. of, of social justice. And right. uh, do you find these two categories um, helpful 
uh, more mm. hurtful? Do you find it biblical? What's your response? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question because I think I've used those terms for years, even social justice or social action, um, and always meant it uh, in conjunction with just living out my faith. And mm. uh, so that was true 30 plus years ago when I was in seminary, there, were, there was a lot of discussion. There was a book by a guy named uh, Ch- Stephen Charles Mott called Biblical Justice and Social Change or something like that. And, mm. uh, and that was a big deal like back in the 80s. <laughs> you know, okay. here I am seeing these same things coming again. So I, I have no problem with the language of social justice, social action, uh, Christian faith, I, but I don't segment them. I, I, mm. I don't fragment them. I see this as part and parcel of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. Well, and I guess we can dig into uh, first and second Peter a bit. And, and we can start with first Peter. Uh, Peter, you know, he gets himself in trouble a bit with at least modern Christians uh, with how we understand his, he's saying to basically submit to our governing authorities. The King James is honor the king in uh, first Peter two, uh, verse 17. Right. And as someone who, who's familiar with, with Peter's letters, uh, can you unpack what Peter means there and maybe what he does not mean? Yeah, I'll try. I mean, one of the, one of the hardest things we have before I even address one particular passage is that in all good exegesis, and we know this, although I don't know if we always like feel it, but we know that first century Rome is not the USA. Mm-hmm. We say that, but then I think we don't always feel it. So, so we'll still do our exegesis as if the letters are written to uh, contemporary Christians in the United States. I mean, these words, these words are true whether they're in Soviet Russia or whether they're in you know, the United States. So, mm-hmm. so I'd say that first. So I wanna go back to Peter's time, which is of course what we're really tasked to do. So you're talking to marginal, um, people on the fringes of society, you know, up there in Asia Minor, who have very little clout um, in terms of political presence, who are actually maligned. So for them, it would make no sense to uh, be um, uh, upstarts to create some havoc against the Roman Empire. I mean, we know crucifixion is, is, a, is, is a real deal at the time, right? So Peter's advice throughout the whole letter is really a formula for survival. It's a formula for how do I live the character of Jesus and also survive? So you live the character of Jesus with, there's a lot of one another language of how you treat each other. So there in that chapter three, you're gonna get to, there's uh, after the message to husbands and wives there's a message that all of you, you know, be sympathetic and, and humble toward one another, you know, loving to each other, uses Philadelphia, you know, these kinds of, images there. So there's this healthy inside community, but then there's this also this very prophetic posture to the broader community by not being uh, a problem to the society that's going to get you killed, but by living this character of Jesus. But notice the language. He says to you, honor the emperor, um, but you fear God. There's, mm-hmm. a, there's a certain deep respect for God and for God's people and for Jesus that's different than the deference that you show to the emperor. Wow. Wow. That, that is powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and you did mention, um, I, I guess, in chapter three, when he's saying for mm-hmm. women to submit, can you unpack also, it's, it's so much ink has been spilt over, um, over, you know, women in ministry or over yeah. wives submitting. Can, can you unpack what you feel that Peter is saying when he says wives submit to your husband? Yeah, I'll try because he says submit a few times. He has, it comes actually after he's already told the household slaves to submit to their masters. He now says, now likewise, you know, you wives submit. So we have here, just again, contextually, women who have no cloud in their society, who are, uh, while they may have citizenship, they don't have this, they don't, they're not of the same status as men. Mm-hmm. And if they are Christian and their husband not, then they're in this really vulnerable position, right? Because their husbands, the part of familias, he gets to set the religious tone for the household and everything else. So now, if these women are gonna live out their faith, how do they do that? They do that by showing uh, culturally the appropriate deference to their husbands that is expected of them. But Peter has a strategic way of telling them, but you get to show us what it's like to be a witness 
without words. He says that mm. they might be won over without words. Wow. And uh, so, and they do this by their behavior. So these, these wives are teaching us, what does it mean to do evangelism without talking? And uh, so they become models for us of evangelism. But they're very, but the idea of, of humbling yourself, I mean, to put it even in that reflexive sense, to submit yourself means that you're taking a posture of humility and, and giving someone else uh, a prominent place. That's, that's Christian behavior, period. But Peter is saying to do that with the no, notion, once again, of protecting yourself in a very vulnerable situation. The same thing with the slaves is that self-preservation requires that you not upset society's apple cart um, when it could mean your death. And I guess I want to ask you, um, when it comes to our our um, how to to respond to society and 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 be political, because I hear you yeah. saying uh, we, we are to be political, but but how does that play out? And and yeah. what do you what do you see in in the church, left and right, or moderates, yeah. uh, in how they're doing that wrong? Maybe. Well, I do think it keeps coming back to this isn't Rome, and this is. This is our unique space and time where the country's uh, founding documents said more than they may have even intended, because the founding documents are speaking to this equality of humanity that the founders may not have even envisioned, of course, as we know, many were slave owners, so, mm -hmm. and so were patriarchal. So we have seen it grow to be more of what those words could really mean. So given the American context, uh, it it, it resonates with at least part of our Christian understanding in that if there is an equality among human beings, Galatians 3.28, neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male, female, if there's a certain uh, equality of human humanity that's born out in, um, uh, in, in the way of Christ, that can play out in a country that is also espousing similar kind of uh, uh, equality. So I'm saying that the context matters. So I, I would not be, um, I wouldn't tell I, I mean, I don't, I, I'm no expert, but there are ways that people in other countries have protested their government that um, uh, was strategic, like the Arab Spring in some places, because in some contexts it could be just, it could be brutal. So you don't take those risks. And um, uh, uh, so I don't wanna speak to uh, the country's politics. I don't know well enough, but my point is our country has allowed for such expression. Mm -hmm. Our country has been built on such expression. So there is a way that for Christians to be, to engage politically, that's in sync with what we say about our country. Okay. And, and I've asked, so a, a lot of Pauline scholars, this, I've never asked a Petrian scholar, mm -hmm. you're the first um, on overthinking Christian. Um, but my question is, if Peter was somehow transported into our uh, modern situation, and he mm -hmm. visited our uh, American churches and um, how, <laughs> how, how we do church, how we think about church. Yeah. Um, how do you think he would respond and even what might he resonate with? Wow, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I need to think more about that for the Bible in general as I teach my classes. Sometimes we try to make those leaps without really thinking about it very much. Mm -hmm. I, yes. think, I think the Christian, I think biblical writers, Paul or Peter, would be overwhelmed with the sense that we are um, allegedly not, allegedly the majority of, of people in the country professing Jesus. I think they would be overwhelmed that Christians not, are not um, a marginalized minority of people. Mm -hmm. So, because that's who they're used to talking to. They're used to, they, they can't even say Rome. I mean, they say Babylon, a little code here to say, you know how wicked this place is and how ungodly um, and, and they are this little small group within that. Yeah, and, and, and I don't think that they would see Christians as having any kind of clout to be able to change the governmental structures. They see it as building up these communities that are like Jesus that would start to make an impact on the rest of their world. So I think if Peter come back, he'd be overwhelmed with how, how, um, how many people profess to be Christian, but he'd probably be disappointed with how uh, with our lack of transformation as people who profess Jesus. In other words, we, might, we don't all look like Jesus very much. Sure, sure. Yeah. And um, I, I, mentioned, I mean, you mentioned Paul. I, I, I don't know. I think I mentioned Paul first. But when it comes to Peter's mm -hmm. letters, they're often um, 
or they can be overshadowed by by Paul's letters. Um, sure. And when, yeah, when individuals and communities, when we um, when we neglect uh, First and Second Peter, what do we miss out on? And then yeah. when 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 I guess what do we gain by? Yeah, that's a, that's another great question, and I, I appreciate that because someone who who is spending time in the general epistles and the Catholic letters, there's there is a sense that we get overshadowed by Paul, and, and admittedly, Paul wrote a lot, and he's certainly prominent. And no, not taking no shade on Paul, of course, but I think what we miss out is that we we miss out on the voice of uh, of a follower of Jesus, because if it is really Peter who wrote First Peter. Uh, uh, at least, then um, we get somebody who was an eyewitness. We also get somebody who um, who was not a citizen, you know, being being this Jew, marginalized person there. We get somebody who represents sort of the regular person, you know, and not, and, and Paul had a fairly prominent place, you know, he's, he's Jewish, yeah, but he's a Roman citizen yeah. and he's got, he's got some, um, uh, some schooling and some training. So we get the re- we get the every person's uh, perspective when we when we listen to Jude and James and Peter we get the uh, the every person the regular person perspective. Okay. And there's some theological points too. I mean, real quickly, I'll say you do get this um, picture of church community that's a little different from Paul. Paul, we get very specific communities, right? We don't know the communities in the general epistles very well. So you get a more general sense of what might be the landscape of Asia Minor, of, uh, of the Christian uh, communities there um, that we don't know super well, like we do say Corinth or Ephesus. Okay. Um, I, I guess um, moving back to um, American politics mm-hmm. um, and, and what is obviously on everyone's mind with what has happened um, at, at the Capitol, although that's just a layer, that's, that's right. just a layer. Right. Um, what do you feel that that Peter has to contribute um, in the New Testament to some something like the problem of evil or societal unrest? Uh, what's Peter's response to the problem of evil? Yeah, um, Peter sees uh, suffering as inevitable, uh, to, you know, for Christians or for humans, perhaps, but for, at least for Christians that he would, you know, he sees, he calls it a fiery ordeal, a fiery trial that you're going through. Um, he sees that as that's the way it is. He says, I was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. You know, So he's acknowledging the reality of suffering in the world. Yet at the same time, he sees that it won't last always. You know, he says that the end of all things is near. He goes on to say, you know, whatever anxiety you have, cast it onto the Lord. He cares for you. So there's a, there's a real sense that the problems are there. They're not they're not going away right away, but they will go away one day, right? Um, and in the meantime, these problems are this opportunity for you to, um, to display in public view very clearly the way Jesus was and the mm-hmm. way Jesus is. You live like him when you are these living stones or when you suffer even for doing the right thing, when you, when you don't run to the riotous excess of your neighbors. I mean, in all these ways, you are showing the way of Christ. So as a marginalized group of people who are experiencing the, the heat of, uh, of society, you have this unique opportunity to model the way of Jesus. Which is another thing, back to your earlier question, I think that's missing often in American Christianity because American Christianity not being marginalized, but maybe mm-hmm. claiming that it is, but, but has, has not figured out what does it mean to model the way of Jesus when you're not in the marginal position. So they have mm-hmm. to sometimes claim like a victim status. You know, I, see, I hear white evangelicalism claiming a victim status or a marginal or a persecuted status when really, they're not being persecuted at all, but they have to claim it because we don't know how to operate, or they don't know how to operate from a place where they're not persecuted. Because Christianity, we don't have very good models of that, certainly in the New Testament. Everybody's marginalized in the, every uh, audience, it appears, is marginalized in the New Testament. Hmm. Yeah, wow, that, that is powerful stuff, thank you. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I wanted to, uh, one of my, my uh, readers, wanted me to ask you about, I guess, unity. 
kind of uh, unity is a word that gets thrown around a lot to kind of just cover up the, the mess we're in or, or the division um, yeah. maybe. And uh, how do you feel we can go forward as, as American yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christians? Well, I think there's a lot to be said for, um, yes, for unity. Um, I think Paul gets at it, Peter gets at it. Um, this is a, a, such an important notion, right, in the New Testament. But, but unity is, is born out of a submission to Christ and, as Ephesians would say, a submission or a, a mutual submission to one another. I would go so far as to say that, excuse me for a moment, <coughs> excuse me, I would go so far as to say that part of that submissive posture is to pay particular attention to those who are on the margins. Paul mm -hmm. says in Romans 12, this is around verse 16, he says, not to put your mind on high things, he said, but be willing to, and here's the debate how to translate, but he says to associate with the lowly, it's either lowly things or lowly people, but most scholars would think, think he means lowly people. So, uh -huh. so Paul is saying, you know, if we're going to have unity here and we've got this weak, strong Jew Gentile kind of tension going on here in the church, you put your attention on the ones who are at the bottom. Uh -huh. This, to me, that's the way of unity which we really have a hard time doing. We want the attention back up on the top. We want it on us, especially if we have the power. But the Bible keeps saying, keeps pushing our eyes and our hands to go lower to those who have who might be overlooked. I think that's true in, throughout the uh, New Testament. Um, uh, and that's what's paradigm shifting. So I hear you saying that, I guess, a love of power or, or status, a love of privilege, or even rights, uh, might plague much of white evangelicalism? Yeah, you said that well. I would say that's the case because when folks are used to being on the top, it's hard to imagine not being there. And even, even to reach toward those who are lower um, in status, I mean, that it doesn't have to diminish you. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, this is Jesus in Philippians too, right? I mean, who didn't mm -hmm. consider equality with God something to be grasped and held on to for personal gain, but instead he emptied himself. And in doing so, God does the exalting, right? Those who humble mm -hmm. themselves will be exalted. And so, so there's this, but, but what I feel is that there's a, a, a clinging on to earthly power that I see in white evangelicalism. So there's a fear to, to give any deference to those who are on the margins because it means, it, it appears to mean loss for them rather than Christ-like gain. Sure. And I do have a question about when it comes to um, to those who say things like, and I say things like this, uh, I, I'm, I'm Christian before I'm political. And sometimes mm -hmm. when you say those kinds of things, people take yeah. it as, I don't want to get involved in politics. Um, yeah. And I know we're going back to politics again. Um, okay. But I, I <laughs> yeah, um, I, I guess when it when it comes to that, what is our stance to be? Are, are we Christians and then political, um, how do you unpack that? Or how do you talk yeah. about this to others? Well, it's, this is hard for me uh, to answer because, not because it's politics, but because it's a, there's a fragmentation. I, I have met most Christians in my life who see Christianity in a, like a hierarchical way or a linear way. Sometimes, you know, interests are stacked up. Like it's, it's my family first and then it's this and then it's this yeah. and it's this. And I see... I see much more of a sphere, right? I see Christ at the center, and then I see all my interests and activities in a sphere around Christ. So it's hard for me to, to like, you know, make them a hierarchy. I see them all as integrated. So my 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 political interest and leanings and activism is related to my wanting to recycle to keep the planet uh, healthy. It's, it's related to me going to the gym to keep my body healthy. It's related to me being a good uh, husband and father. I mean, those things are all tied together for me. So I can't say I'm not political. What I say is my Christian faith requires me to interact with politics in this way or in that way. So it's all part and parcel for me. It's part of what it means mm -hmm. to be a whole Christian in my view. Awesome. And, and I guess I wanted to, to go in a, a little bit of a different direction and maybe sure, we can talk sure. a bit about um, um, the devil and, and the role yeah. that he plays in the world. Because uh, Peter, I don't know if it's first or second where the mm -hmm. devil's mentioned a few times. Uh, is it first? Well, it's definitely mentioned in first Peter and I'm okay. trying to think of second Peter, 
Well, yes, the devil's mentioned in Second Peter too, okay. certainly right, right early on. Uh-huh. Yeah, and and a, a lot of people or a lot of Christians, um, and I, I grew up hearing this when there is evil in the world, sometimes we attribute it to God, um, and and to 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 His hand. Um, in your mind, um, in the New Testament or in Peter, you can whichever direction yeah, sure. you want to take. Um, what is the role of the devil when it comes to, to evil and the chaos um, in our world? And, and another question, I guess, uh, I want to ask is when there's evil and people say things like God is in control, are you comfortable with that kind of language? Yeah, that's, oh, man. Well, I think I'm trying to think, Peter, he doesn't seem like I'm trying to I'm trying to remember passages. If there's any cosmic sense, uh, I guess, in Second Peter, there is. But certainly in Paul and and even in the Gospels, there's a sense that the devil has this uh, freedom, if you will, mm-hmm. to use that word, to to wreak havoc in the world. Yeah. Peter's specific language seems to be personal. He says he's like a roaring lion looking yes. for people to devour. So there's this there's this uh, human, you know, attack kind of uh, motif going on there. But the idea that the devil is is alive and active is certainly true in the Bible, true in the New Testament, true in, in, in the Petrine literature. Um, what's that saying? What that's saying, though, is not not this dualism that there is light and dark and you know and they're equal power, but to say that there is the reality of evil in the world and God knows it and God wants His people to oppose it. Um, I think that's being taught in the Scripture: oppose it in our personal lives and oppose it in the corporate. Uh, a sense of that as well. Um, so when people say God is in control, I th- what I have often taken them to mean was don't despair. In the end, things will get made right because there will be a day of the Lord where where um, the forces of evil will certainly be uh, defeated, vanquished finally. But I think sometimes people use it casually to mean that God is somehow in this evil. Uh, yeah. For that, I would not share that view, <clears throat> but I would share the view that God being in control means that God is not caught off guard by what's happening and that one day, that ultimate day, things will be set right. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I guess um, to, to um, end our time, sure. um, what what do you hope that that white evangelicals will um, can glean from might from the margins. I know you said that this was written mostly for um, for yeah. those minority, but but I, I guess what's what's your own? Uh, let me put it a different way. What has helped you in your um, walk with God and understanding His justice? And what tips can you give to uh, to my listeners for better understanding yeah. God's plan uh, for the, for the world? Yeah, yeah. I I'll say that I I have. I have been slow in my later years now to talk about what white evangelicals should do or think or be. And maybe it's a little bit of being gun shy because when I was younger and I felt I got invited into spaces to speak and to preach and stuff, I was really surprised at how, uh, how, how, cha- how much I got challenged for saying things I thought were very basic in Bible about love and reconciliation and stuff like that. So, so I kind of got gun shot because I thought these are some basic biblical principles and they get seem to get pushed up against. And I, it took me a while to learn what was behind that, you know? So I tend to be slow <clears throat> to uh, say what white people should do. And part of me says like, you know, y'all don't, you're not going to listen to me anyway. So maybe that's mm-hmm. my cynicism. But I will say in light of the second part of your question in terms of of practice and and sense of God's spirit and justice is that I think I have learned that the perspective of people on the bottom or in the margins is much, is often much more accurate than that of the folks on the top because they see the way oppression works out. So I know a lot of denominations, some denominations don't affirm women in ministry. I mean, I do, but, and part of it is my engagement with the biblical text but part of it is also my listening to, to sisters express how the church has treated them. Um, uh, so my advocacy for women is partly born out of what women have taught me. So I have listened to people who have been marginalized and that helps to inform how I behave. So it's not a question for, for me to say, um, this is what I'm gonna do for you. It's more a question for me to say, 
how can I hear you? I mean, and <clears throat> excuse me, and as I hear from you, it helps to shape how I should be. And so I think the posture of any person who wants to be like Jesus is to be a better listener, uh, a more compassionate observer, a more engaged disciple in that sense, and less fearful of losing power. Wow. And, and I also hear there saying, talking about scripture mm -hmm. and experience. It doesn't have to be uh, one or the other. That's, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I guess sometimes there's, there's a fear of, of letting experience go alongside. Yeah. Scripture. And I grew up that way. I grew up, or maybe I shouldn't grew up, but in my twenties, when I was in Christian circles, there was a sense that our experiences or our feelings or our emotions were somehow bad. And mm -hmm. the only thing we could pay attention to was the Bible. But even in our interpretation of the Bible, we weren't honest that we were bringing our feelings and emotions and perspectives on the world, even in our biblical interpretation. So when I look at biblical verses, I'm often told what's right and wrong by a, by a person with a certain perspective. So when I was in churches where men said only men could do this and they would point to the you know, Timothy passages, or whatever, I thought, okay, they're right. But, but then I had to go and listen to some other folks and then start to make some decisions myself, right? So part of that is that is the whole notion that people talk about of social location. Who you are is a factor in how you even read the Bible. So experience, I don't want to minimize it anymore. I want to see my experiences are part of my social location, which is a factor in how I read the Bible. It doesn't change the language of the Bible it yeah. change, or, or, or even change what God's spirit is trying to say, but it opens my eyes to, to more ways of, 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 uh, uh, of understanding. Mm. Yeah, I heard um, one professor talk about Acts 1, or, or was it Acts 2, with the uh, falling of, of the Spirit, and how God, uh, God gave the early church um, power, but he didn't give them control. Uh, that's a good way to say it. I, I yeah. like that. Yeah. Sure. That, that is good. Uh, yeah, Dr. Edwards, I want to thank you for your time. I want to respect it, obviously. And it's it's been such an honor to finally have you on. And I'm, I'm really excited to uh, get my copy of Might from the Margins and just thank interact you. with that. Thank you. I really appreciated this time. God bless you. Okay.